Hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is Sasha Giordano, and I'm the director of the Hofstra University Museum of Art. And I was invited and I'm honored to introduce the artist, Billy Colbert. A few things. Um, thank you for attending today's event, Constant Reminders, an Exploration 125 Years of Black American Visual Culture. There will be a presentation and a discussion on the visual heritage of the Colbert Collection. It's an honor to introduce Billy Colbert. On a personal note, I want to thank him. He came to the museum yesterday and he worked with over 18 students from Freeport Middle School and it was an amazing experience. So I thank you again for your time. Um, and I'm sure today will be another wonderful experience. Mr. Colbert is a Philadelphia-based artist whose work is highly charged with social, political, and historical imagery. He has had solo exhibitions throughout the United States and his art has been part of larger collections in such places as the National Academy of Arts and Sciences in Washington, DC, and the African American Museum in Dallas. In, in 2023, Colbert's work became part of the permanent collection of the National Gallery of Art and the Library of Congress in Washington, DC. His work is currently on view on the campus of Hofstra University in the Rosenberg Gallery through February 11th. So if you haven't visited that exhibition space, you definitely want to get there before the exhibition closes. And the title of that exhibition is, How Do We Get Here? So with no further ado, Billy Colbert. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> Make me feel comfortable so I can loosen up. Um, yeah, so I'm going to start off with a little video that will just give you like an idea of what's going on as far as some of the components that are in the collection. So this video here is kind of a montage of some of the footage that's in there. So I'll play this to get started. Okay, so when we think of moving images, I think of these as cave drawings. I think of these as the things that people have not seen. A lot of the imagery of uh, black folks, people, people see Hollywood and they don't really think of like the real images. So what I've done is I started a collection of over 300 films that were home movies and I've digitized them to actually tell the real story of everyone's life. And that's my goal. But I want people to see this imagery as it is and be able to appreciate it. I think a lot of times you have so much hyperbole when you think of Hollywood and what goes on. There's violence, there's this and that. But when the people are being actually filmed by someone who loves them, you actually get a chance to see the sincerity in the communication and the family life. I'm going to go back to show you some of the earliest films that I have so you get a... Um, idea and these are probably late 30s early 40s um, the one good thing and bad thing about film it doesn't always come with a date so I don't always know where these are from sometimes I don't know exactly what era they're from other than me just kind of piecing it together by fashion or by style or by cars or different things that are kind of going on um, this family right here this is going to start off with a family in Washington DC 
<clears throat> and the interesting thing, how I acquired this set of films was I, I go to flea markets and I was at a flea market. And this is like early 2000, late 90s, early 2000s when gentrification was starting and everybody was selling their houses and getting out of the neighborhood. And as a result, the, the guys who would go in and remove all the trash were like, we've got these box of films sitting back in the corner of this house and we, we're going to throw it away. Do you want it? And I was like, oh, yeah, I want it. And I want any other ones that you get a chance to get your hands on. So I began kind of collecting from the standpoint of trash from people who were leaving the neighborhood um, because of the, the rising cost of housing. And then the families didn't always want to come back to the neighborhood and they just want to sell the house as is. So in this case, I was able to get a full body collection of films from the family from pretty much birth to death. So it's just strange going back and looking at this. And the funny thing is, is I've been going back into this neighborhood and communicating with this family and trying to piece together this history of the neighborhood. Um, so this will take you back to the early, early 40s, late 30s, and you'll get a chance to kind of see and it'll end in the 60s. So some of that imagery was from uh, the campus of a historically black college. Uh, this last part right here is from Tuskegee Institute. Um, there is also footage in there of segregated military camps, which is it's strange because a lot of people think of military and they just think it was always integrated, but in actuality it wasn't. So you're talking about a orchestra playing in the middle of a segregated military camp with all black soldiers. And that's just something that when you see that imagery, it just kind of debunks Hollywood's idea of what was actually happening at that time. Um, so these films have provided like a real rich background for me to kind of go in and investigate and look at things. And it's funny when I look at these things with elders, they're like, oh, yeah, you just didn't know about that. And that's the funny thing. And as a younger person growing up, we would always see pictures. We didn't always have access to film. You didn't always have access to these things. And as I've grown older and began collecting, it's like these are the things that kind of debunk the whole concept of how life was. Granted, life was a little bit different, but it just debunks the whole idea of just some of the things that we see on TV with Hollywood's portrayal of life. Um, now what I'm going to do is go in and start to show you some imagery from these times. And this is going to span a, a great deal of time. It's going to bounce around a little bit. Hopefully. Can everybody see that image? Okay, great. This is a photograph that I found. Um, it's crazy. I don't know what else to say about it, but um, it's, a, it's a beautiful photograph of people finishing up the day working. And I can't see the date. I can't exactly decipher the city in North Carolina that it is. But um, these are one of these photographs when you first see it, it's just like, wow. 
you look through and you just kind of wonder all the stories that accompany each one of these people. And just, I, I have a problem with also getting teary eyed because it's like, what if life was different and they could actually live to fulfill their dreams? But this was it. Um, this is a cotton picker's table. This came out of a book um, that I that I that I bought early on. I can't remember the exact date of this book, but what it does is it breaks down how much money that you would get for picking cotton. So if you look at it, you see how much you you could spend a whole day and you weren't making much money. Obviously, this would have had to have been in the later 1800s or early 1900s, but still, these are like these tables that exist in these old books that we just kind of throw, that people just kind of throw away as trash. Um, a lot of times when you're finding old photographs, this is one that I, I, I love. It's a beautiful photograph. Um, I was wandering around um, online and I found this photograph and I ended up buying a whole stack of photographs that were found. And the one girl right here, she ended up being a vaudevillian actor, performer, and her name is Kentucky Rosebud. And this is a photograph that her mother and her two sisters took together. And I think a lot of times we always think of, um, race and culture and how there was never togetherness. But it's like when you look at these photographs, you see that there was. And over a period of time, as we go through here, you'll see different examples of that. But this is a Victorian photograph of, uh, of a mother with her children. And it to me, it just it begs so many more questions. And like I said, she, she went on to be a vaudevillian actress. Um, the other thing while I'm talking about it, for me, it's fun to find things, but it's really fun to go in and do the research. So sometimes the back of the photograph is equally as important as the front because you can see the image, but then you have this little nugget of hope. <laughs> sometimes it's a name, it's a street address, it's you know some sort of something where you can go in and dig and find more information about the person who's in the photograph. Um, we're, we're on books, so... This book right here was a book that was produced um, in the late 1800s. Um, the Negro is a Beast in the Eyes of God. Obviously a book that is basically, you know, propaganda going through and creating this story for people to read. And it's just this book with a whole bunch of uh, inflammatory sections in it. But I think it's things that people need to see. Um, this is an old uh, postcard. Once again, going back to race and just kind of how you have uh, two people from two different backgrounds in a picture together. Um, this was a postcard that was mailed around. The other thing about postcards that's really interesting is you get these photographs and the postcard and sometimes you flip it over and some of the comments are like looking at a comment in a, in a really bad um, online post because people back then were doing the same thing that they're doing now. Um, going back to schools, this is a photograph of a segregated school in Washington, D.C. I, I like collecting school pictures <clears throat> because I like looking at the classrooms and all the different things that are going on and just kind of um, the way everything's set up, just how the students are sitting there, how the students are dressed, the stuff that's on the board. And it, it's, it's funny. I, I was always told when you're teaching – you almost can break down a classroom as if you're an attorney in the courtroom. And when I look at the way these classrooms are set up, it's somewhat like that. And it just has this feel to it where the, where the children are just so attentive. And I went to an open space school, <laughs> which was a new thing. Anybody here know what I'm talking about? <laughs> it's where there's no walls. <laughs> and it's like, you could look over here. Oh, somebody's getting disciplined over here. And it was like this new thing in the seventies. But I think a lot of us developed the ability to look around the classroom instead of focus. And when you look at these old photographs, it has a lot of that too. Um, here's another uh, photograph as well in the classroom. Um, this is a, whoops. 
This is an oh God, having a little trouble here. All right. Why does it keep doing that? All right. This is uh, from Dallas, Texas, and this is a Sunday school, and all the kids are dressed up to go to Sunday school. It's just a photograph that I really, really liked. Um, it's something about the way that the students, even though they may have had nothing, presented themselves to go and to learn. Learning was something. It was the cherry on top of the, the Sunday. Um, here's another photograph. And it's always interesting to get these photographs and just see how everything is taking place and just look at the the joy that's on everyone's face and the fact that they're coming together to do something. Back in that time, a lot of churches almost seemed like a community center. That was the place where you went because it was a safe haven for all that was going on in other parts of your city. Um, here's another photograph um, of a class picture. And it's interesting to me because um, I always, when I find one with one student of a different race. It's always interesting to collect, connect, collect it and look at that photograph of that student and just kind of see what their body language is. And if you look at the front, this, this young man who's sitting here, <clears throat> he's kind of there, but usually I'd say nine out of 10 times when you find a, a uh, class picture where there's one student of color, they're usually all the way in the back row standing next to the teacher. And it's, it's just interesting. And I, I like the idea of collecting these photos and just kind of seeing this documentation of history and just kind of seeing how everything goes. Um, you can look and see he's the only one, maybe one of the others, just to, to have, uh, you know, there's certain things that he's wearing uh, that, you know, kind of let you know things about him as well as the other students. It's just a interesting um, photograph. Here, you're looking at a photograph that took place later on, you know, after school integration. And in the case of it, instead of it being predominantly white students with it being a, a, a smaller amount of white, uh, predominantly black students with a smaller amount of white students, this is around the time when white flight was taking place in some of the cities. And this is the only child that's not of color in this photograph. Um, going back to this, this is another old photograph. It says 1927. And it's just always interesting to me to just get these and see where we were as people at that time. Um, this one right here is dear to me. This is my grandfather who uh, went on to be a Tuskegee Airman. And this is his uh, 1927 high school photograph of Wiley H. Bates High School in Annapolis, Maryland. And, you know, in this photograph, you have a judge, you have a Tuskegee Airman, you have other people who went on to do successful things, but their uniforms were ragtag. He would sit here and laugh and tell me about all these different things about the people that were in them and how their uniforms didn't match up, but they were prideful people. So it's like in these photographs, you see so much. This is an illustration that was in um, a book that was written in the early 1900s, and we're going to go through and see that later on. It's called The College of Life. There was a book that was written um, by Black people for Black people to go out and give you the experience and have you understand how to maintain a, a solid, healthy life. And it's a book, it's about this thick, and you could go from anywhere from finances to personal health, personal hygiene, relationship health. And it's really funny. I was in Charlottesville, Virginia, and I walked into a bookstore as I always do. And I asked him if they had anything. And the guy was like, yeah, we do, but it's pricey. I was like, I'm not worried about pricey. I'm just see if you have something. Come to find out later on that was on the corner, very close to where the accidents happened in Charlottesville when the riot took place. So it's like there's always these weird connections that you have when you get something. This is another illustration. These illustrations are properly done. A lot of times illustrations at that time because they weren't always done by people of color. They were 
kind of a little bit more crude, but these are highly detailed and some of the better illustrations I've seen for this time. Um, this right here is, um, it blew my mind when I first saw it. It's an illustration that came out of uh, a book. It was the centerfold. And we always talk about cotton <clears throat> and we talk about how big cotton was. But not until you look at this do you realize it was pretty much one of the main financial engines of this country. And when you look all the way back and to the depth of this and how this was the centerpiece of a two volume, two set volume of books about the Civil War that was written, I'd say it was like late 1800s. Do you get a chance to just take this in? And it's a beautiful illustration. When I first saw it, I, uh, I didn't know what to do. It just kind of captivated me, but it's like, it's so detailed. It just tells you the whole, the picking, the shipping, the, the selling, and it just breaks everything down. And um, this was tech back then. Um, this is a photograph of people enjoying their time. Uh, what a lot of times people would do is they would go out and they would have a painted background and they would stand behind it. But this is a young man and a, a woman going out to enjoy their night in the town. I would say this is probably 40s, but um, it's just a beautiful picture. Um, this picture came out of Chicago and it's just like this real graceful elegance in, in this photograph. Um, it was taken in 19... I think it's 1901 or 19, oh, 1905, but you get a chance to see just the elegance that people had. The other thing that's interesting about this, um, this is doing the history on this photographer, the photography studio, it was a white um, photographer that allowed this gentleman to come in and get his picture taken. So once again, going back to what I was saying about the front and the back, on the back, you're able to find the name of this gentleman. You're able to find where he lived. You were able to find out when the photo was taken. This was taken in 1901. And then you can also do research on the photographer. <clears throat> so this is like one of the things that I like to do. Usually when you go back and trace the photographs, you can find, you know, there was a vibrancy around that area, but it no longer exists. So just to look at this photograph and then to be able to go into the research on that visual. Um, this is a detailed illustration um, from an advertising that I, f I found to be to be interesting. And um, it's just colorful, joyous, playful, and it's advertising chocolates. Going back to the films, a lot of times this is how I get the films. They're in um, eight millimeter, sometimes 16 millimeter format. And each one of them usually has a surprise where <clears throat> it'll have the address and you're able to trace that address back and just kind of see what's there now. And also sometimes they have a family name. You can trace the family name and just kind of see where they are and see what's going on and reach out because sometimes these things come into your hands and you, you have no idea how and you wonder, you know, why did someone throw this away? Or does somebody want these? Does somebody want their record of their own history? It's really weird. One time I, um, I brought a bunch of films from a family in Atlanta. The father had great means. He was a pilot. He had a uh, personal jet and would fly around. And I'm looking through the films, and they were friends with Sidney Poitier. They would go to Sidney Poitier's house and film. <laughs> So here I have this imagery of Cindy Portier dancing and talking around the house. But it's just amazing how much stuff was getting thrown away. This is the first um, Dick and Jane book cover to include African-American kids. And um, book, actually. And it just is really interesting to me, the dynamics of this photograph um, and how it kind of speaks to many things, but it's just kind of a, this is the first one. I felt it was necessary to have it. Um, this is a 
for the Ritz Carlton Hotel, if you needed a bellhop, this is what you would stick on your door in the 1930s. And it's just crazy to me to think that, it, you know, that this object still exists, but it was something that I wanted to get just to kind of uh, help, you know, capture this time and just how brutal things were. Um, this is uh, flight records from Tuskegee Airmen. And the thing that's really funny about the flight records of Tuskegee Airmen, even if you would get 100%, they would give you a 99.5 because they would say you're black and there's no way you could get 100%. So that was something that talking to Tuskegee Airmen, that was something that they had to live with for the rest of their life to burn them up. I'm using their term, burn them up. <laughs> um, this is a photograph of an integrated school, and we'll get to this this uh, this later. This is um, actually University of Michigan. Um, this is a World War One photograph, kind of like a painting type of photo that they used to do at that time. Um, soldiers used to send them home to their family, or if the soldier passed away in the war, these they would make these, and this is the original frame and. This is, I don't know how old it actually is, but it's just something that I felt like I had to have. And I found this at an antique store and they just kind of had it there and didn't see any value in it. And I was like, yeah, I want it. This is another um, drawing that uh, I'm not exactly sure of the date when this was made. Um, original frame, obviously the original glass. And um, just to collect this and have this, it's the whole point of um, having an image of yourself. Uh, Frederick Douglass at one point was the most photographed black man because he said he wanted people to see what a positive image of a black man looked like and he encouraged others to go out and get photographs of themselves. And so if you couldn't afford a photograph, there was times when people would go out and get um, have drawings done as you can see here. Um, wonderful photograph. Uh, these are ovals that come in like a bubble glass. The bubble glass, it's hard to keep it, you know, in time and travel, it usually ends up breaking. But the beautiful thing about this, the artist and photographer who created it wrote the lady's name down on the back. So I'm able to trace her and trace the family. <laughs> and kind of go back and do research on her just based on that one little name that I have that if I just had the photo, I wouldn't be able to trace it. Um, you know, vintage wedding photo. Once again, with the bubble glass, it's just uh, an elegant photo that was touched up by a painting. So you get a chance to kind of see the enhancement to make the dress a little glow a little bit and seem a little bit more uh, interesting. But um, these were something that was, they're just really coveted photographs. Not many of these exist. Every once in a while, I'll find them around. I'll go to flea markets really early. And sometimes you find stuff like this. Um, I, I travel a lot to go to different things. And in this case, I got up early one Tuesday morning and drove to the Eastern Shore of Maryland. And there used to be this uh, <clears throat> auction house called Crumpton. It's huge. You know, and everybody would just come out and put stuff out in the field. And I identified these two pictures. And I was like, I don't care what I have to pay. <laughs> I'm getting these two. When I first saw them, I thought they were drawings. I mean, I thought they were photographs. But these are actually drawings. And um, if you can look uh, it's not gonna work. and see how detailed that is, these are drawings from... I'd say early 1900s. And the thing that's really interesting about them is it's the husband and the wife. And um, they sat in the back of a barn for nearly 100 years. And um, they, they find, somebody finally sold the land. And they found these back at the at the end of the barn. I was thinking that these were going to cost easily five hundred to a thousand dollars each. Whoever had them just wanted to get rid of them. I got both of these photographs for forty dollars, just because 
no one saw the value in it. And it's not that I'm talking value from the standpoint of financial reward. It's more or less the value of preserving a culture. Um, this one had already kind of gotten eaten a little bit by insects, but it's still just like a beautiful, beautiful image. Um, Black Panther Party and collecting and finding stuff still left over from, from their era. Um, this is a news bulletin from the Black Panther Party and it's something that's really interesting to me. You have a lot of Black Panther information that's still out there and now Emery Douglas, who was the um, communications chief of the Black Panthers, he was also do the illustrations and that style has came back where they've he's done a show at, at at several different museums around the country and it's like they were creating this stuff they were putting the word in the street so it's like now when we go back and we look at the artwork that's connected to it it's it's coming back around in style and little did we know that that would be the case i mean it was always cool but i don't think everybody always saw it that way here's the back of the publication and it was you know grassroots publication, information going out to the people. Um, here's the book that I was talking about, <clears throat> The College of Life. It's just a beautiful book written in the early 1800s. Um, I had no idea about it, and I was just searching, and I, when I actually found the book, I grabbed it. And I mean, still to this day, it is a book that tells you everything you need to know as a person. Like, it's very fundamental and basic, but it tells you a lot of things um, from how to choose a mate, how to take care of yourself, how to eat. It tells you all of these different things. So here, here goes the, um, the inside of the book, if you want to look and see what it is, a manual of self-improvement for the colored race. This is a interesting photograph that was probably, I'd say 1940s, possibly 50s. It's like a photo illustration. Um, it, it just, I don't know, it was just one of those things I saw it and I, I liked the way that it looked and I wanted to grab it because I don't really have too many things from this era. Um, going back to race again, uh, these are photographs from Pittsburgh. Um, I can't remember what it was called. Pittsburgh uh, had a black newspaper and when the photographer died, he released, they released all the negatives. And these are some of the negatives that they had. You know, you had people of uh, mixed race out drinking their Iron City beer and hanging out. And uh, it was kind of interesting. There's one of black women with white men and one with black men with white women. Um, this right here is a uh, toy. It's, um, Floyd Patterson, heavyweight boxing champion. And this is something that was made to kind of celebrate him being a champion. And it's one of those things you have and you it punches. But um, objects like this, they're just priceless and they're just hard to find, but they're just so interesting. They all have like this really beautiful patina to them. Um, this is another photograph um, of Omega Psi Phi fraternity. And this is around, geez, early 1900s, no later than 1915. And this is a uh, event that was being held, a uh, ball. Um, this is an autobiography by Jack Johnson. For those of you who don't know, Jack Johnson was the uh, first black heavyweight boxing champion. And, you know, he went through so many different things <clears throat> by being the black heavyweight champion. And I had no idea he wrote an autobiography. And one day I was searching in an old bookstore and I found this for like $3. And it was funny going through and just reading all the things in the book. And one of the articles is, one of the sections is, his wife had to come out and basically speak on his behalf to get people to be interested in the book. 
and go through and talk about the book and talk about how he was a, you know, a fine human being, which is not something that would have happened if it was a, another, a person of another color. Um, these are old Jet magazines. Um, you know, it's like for me as an artist, this is something that I grew up making collages the Jet met with Jet magazines and Ebony magazines, but it's like when you look back, these were the publications. I, me I remember being a kid waiting for Ebony and Jet to come in the mail. Um, this right here is a mug shot from Baltimore, Maryland. And um, it's interesting, I collect mug shots because I did a series of artwork that was based around mug shots, but also to get people to understand if you weren't of a certain wealth, you probably didn't have any photographs of yourself. So a lot of these mug shots, these may be the only photographs of these people. This is just a uh, captivating photograph that uh, I found. Um, I don't know what it is. It's, I have no idea what's going on, but it's just a beautiful photograph. Um, yeah, this is another photograph from the 60s, maybe the 50s, but um, <clears throat> sometimes you can buy photographs that are old news releases, and in the case of this one, this, that's what this is. Um, this is a young boy in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, this is another photograph. I'm not exactly sure where this photograph is from, but these are all... Um, Reconstruction era. This is a photograph of Harry Belafonte at Martin Luther King's funeral. This photograph right here, when I found it, it um, almost makes you cry. This is uh, the horse-drawn carriage going through Memphis for Martin Luther King's funeral. And if you look, you can just see the depth and how many people are just lined up in the streets and how the gentleman over here is trying to have everybody pull away to create a space for the horse-drawn carriage to go through the streets. And it's, 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 it's strange that I'm sitting here talking to you about these photographs and most of these I've found somewhere or purchased for very little because no one saw them as being significant. But I think there's like a whole history that needs to be revamped with these photographs and these images, and that's what I'm trying to do. Um, <clears throat> this is a, this is a uh, photograph of a domestic, and it just signed to Mass Bessie from Baby. I brought this in Dallas, Texas. And the thing is really funny, even though I, I brought this photograph in Dallas, Texas over 20 years ago, the photograph itself was taken in Seattle. So it's really interesting how these things travel from place to place. I have no idea how it got there. Um, we'll go forward. This is a mugshot of Cora West. And uh, this was taken in Atlantic City in 19... I'd say like 1910. <clears throat> and you, of course you have the profile and you have the, um, the frontal view. But the thing that's interesting about mug shots taken during this time, they did something called the Bertillon method. And the Bertillon method was developed by the French scientist Bertillon. And um, what you would do is you would measure the physical characteristics of each human being, their marks, their scars, and their moles, the distance between their eyes, the distance around their head, et cetera. And then you would come up with this measurement so that you were able to tell who this person was if they were running in the streets or doing something else and you would be able to identify these people based on these characteristics. What they found out is people didn't travel very far at that time. So a lot of relatives were being convicted for the crimes that another relative did. And so they were trying to figure out a way to make you know, make certain each person was um, identified specifically. And then they talked to the to the Chinese and the Chinese are like, we've been using the uh, fingerprint forever. 
And so that's when everything went from the Bertillion method, I'd say like in the late teens to the early 20s. And then they went to the fingerprinting method. <clears throat> and this was, she was in Atlantic City, New Jersey, and, and she was at uh, shoplifting. Here we go with the fingerprint. Um, sometimes it's interesting to just kind of capture these and see what it is. This is a uh, mugshot from <coughs> New Orleans, and you're able to see uh, everything that kind of goes along with it. Also, you get this look in their eyes as to like, what, what have I done? What's going on? What are you doing with that device in front of me? Because a lot of people had no idea what a camera was. Um, here's another one dealing with the mark scars and the moles and the Bertillion method is on the front. Um, you know, you see some of these mug shots, you have things from people stealing livestock so they can eat and stay alive to just various things. But it's like, you know, some of them I've even purchased that are mug shots of people who were arrested for loitering. And I was able to follow their lives and realize that they went on to be successful people. But what um, policemen would do is walk around the city with a whole stack of uh, mug shots and they would pull these people in for like little tiny crimes. Um, this is a book that was actually written by uh, Agatha Christie. Um, I was in Corpus Christi, Texas doing an art exhibition and um, towards the end of the exhibition, I kept seeing this guy kind of looking at me and, you know, I didn't know what was going on. And then he sent one of the handlers from the, from the gallery over to me and he was like, I would like you to come to my house. I have something that I would like to give you. And I was like, okay. So I got a crew of people together and we went to his house. And he said, um, I have this book and a friend of mine passed away and he left me as the overseer of his uh, estate and this book was in it and I have no idea why it was, but I think that you should have it. And he, I, I gladly accepted the book and it was a book that was written by Agatha Christie and um, it's called 10 Little Niggers and what happens throughout each page of the book all the kids get killed until it gets to zero. And they have a music that goes, sheet music that goes with it. This book was just wonderfully made with linen, bound together, and um, this is what we get. And it's really funny, I've always wanted to get with one of my musician friends and create a score, create this as a score to like some short film, just so people can understand how absurd this is. But throughout the book, one gets killed, two gets killed, three gets killed, and that's what it is. Um, this is a book, um, a, a magazine, Negro Digest, that uh, this was the 1943, so we're looking at 80 some years ago. And the funny thing about these books is when you look into these old books, there's no advertisement. So it wasn't like you were having, uh, you know, palm olive soap or downy or anybody advertising these books these books were made by the people for the people um this is an old postcard which just the color in it is just beautiful um here's another one it's of a vaudevillian performer and get the hook meaning get pulled off the stage um this is the one photograph that i was talking about and um how you're able to see you know, where these kids usually stand in these photographs. <clears throat> and I just find these to be beautiful anyway, but it's just always interesting when you find uh, such a disparity in, in race in the, in, this class, in the classrooms. This is a tintype. Um, tintypes were photographs that were developed on tin. And uh, this is... Um, this is uh, one of my favorite photographs. It's, uh, and no one has this photograph. It's, um, it's a photograph of the Tuskegee Airmen. Uh, and if you look, it's just a, an amazing photograph. And it's like, when I look at it, I, I look and I see the pride that's in them and in their eyes and in their smiles. And on the back is the autographs of each one of them. 
this was my grandfather's when he uh, graduated from Tuskegee. But it's like something that I've held on to because you don't really always see photographs like this. Now it's kind of moved on to illustration or you see him by the plane. But just this photograph here is just something that's just beautiful and priceless to me. This is one of the probably early pieces of clip art that you'll never see. And um, this is from a book that was written in the 1800s. <clears throat> and this was actually a piece of the artwork that went into the book. And for those of you who are at my exhibition at the, at the gallery across the street, you'll, you'll see that this picture, this image is in that piece. But it's things like this, like through the digging, through the searching, you find all of this stuff that is timeless. And what I'm trying to do is gather it and have it in one place and have it as kind of almost like an archive for people to look at and see so that we can learn and go forward and um, not make the same mistake again. Um, sports fans in here, I hope everybody knows this is Muhammad Ali, Joe Frazier, but you know, there's people who throw things away that just don't see any value in it. And for me, it's like growing up in the era of Muhammad Ali, this is always somebody who's um, really been an idol of mine. So when I found this, I was like, are you kidding me? But um, yeah. Now, this is where I'm going to end off because I'm probably running <laughs> a little bit late. Um, Sometimes I'm, I'm collect, when I'm out collecting and out doing things, it's like people will talk to me about certain things. And in the case of this one, I was looking, I was buying some things from one of the vendors and this lady comes up to me and she's like, I have some stuff at my house that you may want. And I was like, okay, you know, you're at a flea market. You have no idea what anybody's talking about. And she's like, no, you, I have something that, that you may want. So I give her my number, I go home, she sends me a text. Um, <laughs> And I get the text and then we communicate for most of the day and we figure out how we're gonna exchange and I'm gonna come pick up the book. So the next day I go to her house and get the book. I meet her and her husband and you know we talk about the books. She had two books from early 1900s that were photo albums that were still intact, okay? And I'm leaving, after thanking them and leaving, she was like, don't, be frightened by the murder that's in the back of the book. And I was like, huh? So I didn't, I didn't want to be a kid and dump all the cereal out of the box and get the prize. So I went through the book piece by piece by piece. And I get to the back and I find this. And I probably spent five days of my life trying to figure this out. <clears throat> I've started doing research on it. What happened was um, the man who was in the photo album was an auditor for the National Baptist Church. He went to Chicago and audited one of the churches and found out they were $60,000 in the rear. As a result, the pastor and his son allegedly murdered this man. They took his body across state lines and made it seem like it was a racially motivated murder. And they took him to Tennessee. And as a result, Tennessee said they weren't going to touch it. And I had no idea or no information about any of this. And then when I read it, I just went back and I found a professor from Harvard had included some of this in a book that he wrote, but it was talking about how powerful the black church was after reconstruction. And this was one of these things that just really kind of like blew my mind. <clears throat> and I'm in the process of working and seeing how I can turn this into something more of a movie because the photographs of the family like this, like you just don't see photographs like this from that era. And it was something that just blew my mind. So I've been like going down this rabbit hole of these visuals that you sometimes find and just trying to do like the research that goes along with them because I can look at a photo and say, oh, that's awesome. That's great. That's beautiful. But then it's like, you want to know more about that person. You want to know what they did, what life they lived. So I, 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 get, I get caught up and I dig in and go a little bit further. Um, I think we'll probably stop there because it seems like I could talk for a long time. <laughs> and I'll give everyone a chance to ask questions. Thank you.
Yeah, they're going to put it up anyway. So what we'll do is we'll just have like a little question and answer session. Uh, we'll be up here. We just have to have a mic on. So if you want to ask a question, you'll have to come up to the, the microphone that's in the middle of the, uh, the, hall, uh, the, the uh, hallway right here. Okay. Well, I've got a question, Billy. Me too. Oh, you want to go first? You go first. All right. Well, this is because I'm, you know, I teach painting and drawing at the university, and I, I was amazed at seeing the uh, the plethora of, of uh, visual, in, you know, stimulation you must receive from this. Because I've known Billy for a very long time, and as I was sitting there looking at these, I said to myself, you know, I. I've never seen Billy really make a drawing. And I wonder, are, do you think this is basically your, your, your drawing, your impetus for the, for the work? Or do you make drawings and I just don't know about it? I do make drawings. Yes. Yes, you, you'll use this. <laughs> I do make, is this on? Yeah. I do make drawings, but for me, my inspiration comes through film and photography. So when I have something that's there, I kind of got bored at a young age of like, oh, yeah, I'm going to draw a still life of this. But it's like, oh, here's this picture of it. And I know that's probably not what some of the students in here should be hearing, but that's, that's just kind of how I see it. And so from there, it's like my mind works where it's always collecting. I can look at this and see something on the same plane, same perspective, and then bring it in. And then I'm creating this image that is a kind of a collection of my day, if that makes any sense but it's like always kind of like the collaging mind, taking that in and moving into another direction. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Sasha? So if you haven't been to the Rosenberg Gallery to see Billy's paintings, I really encourage you to do that before it closes on February 11th because after seeing your collection, I now see your paintings in a whole different way. Mm -hmm. And I'd asked you yesterday, what is your reference? So this is your reference. Yeah. This is your reference. Easy. Yeah. And um, so to see how you manipulate this history, mm -hmm. because that's what you're collecting, this history, and then how it translates into those paintings is just really powerful. Mm -hmm. But where are you keeping all of this? And how are you storing it? And when did you start collecting it? I started like 25 years ago. And I have like a storage locker <laughs> where I keep everything. And it gets to the point of... I, I say I'm going to stop, but it's like I'll go somewhere and see something. And it's like, OK, I got to get that. And now I'm at the point where I need to stop. And I also need to like figure out where it's going to go. So I'm like talking to different institutions and seeing if there's a way. Because it's like a whole teachable archive. I mean, there's over 300 films, hundreds of photographs, objects that, you know, they don't deserve to be stored in a storage, you know, unit they need to be out so people can see them and so that's part of this whole drive is to get um you know get people to understand that it needs to be accessible and be able to be seen because i'm guessing that storage unit is not like humidity control oh, yeah, it's, is it's it good. is yeah, it yeah, yeah. climate control okay okay because <laughs> yeah. we had and i don't know how the students feel about this but to me art and artifacts and material culture is how I understand history. Mm -hmm. Like that's the picture book to history. Yeah. So after seeing your presentation, it just layers. Like I'm making all these connections to the information I know, but I'm seeing it. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if anyone feels that, any of the students feel that way as well. Or if you have any questions um, that builds on that. You know, I was thinking as you, as you were talking, Sasha, that, um, you know, as I was looking at the imagery and just w when students would walk into Rosenberg Gallery when we did the original opening back in November, uh, I can remember a lot of the, the the reactions was, oh wow, these are beautiful. These are wow, these are these are so colorful. They're, they're, these are gorgeous. But when you're giving your talk and you're showing your work, that the, the reference point you're coming from. You even said, you know, sometimes there's I, I almost feel like there's tears in my eyes. Well, I almost got moved a little bit in there. And I'm trying to ask you, how come your work, you think, comes across in such a jaunty kind of like 
almost playful way when it's dealing with such heavy, heavy imagery. It has to. I mean, it's, it's, it has to because that's the only way you're going to invite people to look at it. I mean, if you say, look, I'm telling you this story about <laughs> hundreds of years of oppression. Okay, you know, t check, please. Nobody wants to hear that. But it's like if you get them to come in and look at it and see it from references that they're allowed to connect to through their own growth and development, you know, you have to bring in recognizable imagery to kind of intersperse to allow it to tell the story. I mean, it's a delicate balance. I had um, Reginald Hudlin, who is like a film director, and he ran a bunch of like, uh, gosh, I can't even remember what he does now. He 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 produced a whole, I think he's like the executive producer of Blackish. I had this piece that he came to me, he was like, I love it. And he was like, the only problem is, is tomorrow I might not love it. And he's like, some days I'm gonna smile, the next day I'm gonna cry. And he's like, I don't think I, can put this in my house. And he's like, but I love it. And he's like, I just have to be real with you. And so sometimes there's that attachment to it that people have. I mean, one that's really funny with me that is drawn lines down the middle of my house with my parents is the lawn jockey. The lawn jockey is not a derogatory thing. Um, I brought a mold for a lawn jockey from years ago. I found this guy in Indiana. He was like, I'm getting kind of worried. Things are getting kind of getting kind of crazy here. I need to get rid of this thing. And I was like, OK. But the original lawn jockey was a um, statue that was made <clears throat> after George Washington's, um, one of George Washington's guides who froze to death. After that, it became a jockey that was made for the Kentucky Derby. So what would happen in Kentucky was each year that the, um, the each year winner of the Kentucky Derby, they would use the lawn jockeys to paint them to replicate what the winner of the Kentucky Derby looked like. I think it was like the first 13 out of the first 18 jockeys were black. So they painted these faces black and they painted their silks to match and everybody thought it was a derogatory thing, but in actuality, they were paying homage to the jockeys who won the races. But the problem was the jockeys were later forced out of horse racing because they were buying their families out of, buying their families to freedom. And so they started killing black jockeys. They started running black jockeys out. And then after a while, you didn't have any black jockeys anymore. But that whole imagery was perverted by something to make it seem like that these jockey, this was a bad image, but it wasn't. So a lot of times we have to really look at like what it is, why it is, and kind of reconfigure it in our minds and not go by what we were told. I had no idea that story. As of most of the stories and the images you were talking about, it, it, it's, it, it, it's, it's lost on it's me. Not taught. It's, it's not part of my history. Yeah. And that's what I was thinking too, like what's taught and what's not taught. Yeah. And some of the books that you had shown, like there's this woman, Elizabeth Keckley, and I don't know if anyone knows her, but she's, she was uh, Mrs. Lincoln's dressmaker and she was a slave and she bought her freedom. And then she really became endeared by Mrs. Lincoln. And in Washington DC, she had started different groups of like, you know, um, people who were finding their way to freedom of like how to live, how to live on their own, how to manage their finances. And I never knew that. Yeah. Like, how did I not know that? Yeah. So like, to yeah. your point, what we're taught and what, what history exists that's not covered. I think yeah. that's why some of you know, work like yours is so vital. Yeah. And it's, it's not an easy sell to say, look, this is what I'm going to talk about. This is what I want to do. But I think that it's something that's like necessary. Like, I think anybody can learn from, it can, can benefit from learning about anybody else. Yeah. It's just kind of how it is. And, um, you know, I, I think also it's like so many of these photographs, some of these people, some of their families have never seen them, you know? And it's like, why not preserve this culture, these visuals, and allow people to see it? Any questions? Yes. Sure.
what ages to put on the canvas, how big to use and small to use them. The images are so vibrant and engaging, but I wonder if they distill all this information for you. Yeah, that's that's a crazy part of it. It's like, you know, I, I tell this to my students all the time, there's art and there's science. That's probably the art part where it's like, I will somehow create this. And sometimes it's a, a visual that you're indexing images through your mind. And as a result of the indexing of images, you're like, okay, I need to pull that out, I need to pull that out, I need to pull that out. And because you have these things in your head, you're able to kind of pull from this mental archive that you have. That's the one good thing. It's like if I were to go to an archive and try to pull things out, it would take me forever. But because I'm collecting them, I know what's there and I can I can go ahead and get it. I'm almost like the old man that's like, let me listen to your car. Oh, I can tell you what's wrong with that. Right. <laughs> Thank you. It's like you've become the archive too. It's really interesting. Yeah, I know. I am getting older. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh -huh. Hello. Hello. It's really nice to meet you. Likewise. Everything you have to show is very interesting. Thank you. As well as your art in the gallery. I was just curious to know what artifact that you found had the most impact on you? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, to be honest with you, if you would have asked me this a couple months ago, I might have said something else. But to be honest with you, the, the, the book with the... Um, uh, the murder in the back, I'm still stuck on that. Like to the point where I've called a forensic scientist to also pull information because it's just, it's not that it's, you know, it's just, it's just going into it. And, and also it, if you have an object and you don't have any history with it, sometimes it gets caught, you, you get lost. Um, probably the one that still also gets me when I got out, first got out of college, um, I got contacted by someone to create a chalkboard for a school that was desegregated. And after it was desegregated, um, well, after the after the schools became desegregated, this was an old black school building. The students wrote a message on the board, and it had sat there for like fifty years. And I got a call from the municipality and they were like, we're looking for somebody to come in and do an art project and interpret this chalkboard. And I, they were like, hey, we'll call you back. Well, we're gonna do it, we're gonna do it. I called them probably every week for about two years. And this one still, I have no idea what's on this chalkboard. And I wanted to go and interpret it, but somehow, you know, the grant money got pushed aside and something didn't happen. That's one that really gets me because that one was like 30 years ago. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Hi. So you re you essentially recalled how black history, the way that you're doing it through art, through the art that you displayed, it's not being dummied down in a way, but it's more being told through a lighthearted sense. And then that made me reflect on just like generally your opinion on how black history is being taught in schools, like even at an elementary school, middle school, high school, even a college level. Like, do you think that doing it that sort of way would be beneficial for, you know, kids and just really anyone? At that level? No, I don't think it's good to dummy down anything. Um, I think in the sense of what I was talking about was making it accessible from the standpoint of people so they can see it. So there's pieces in that gallery that you're gonna turn your head, you know? And as a result, it's like you're seeing things. Some of the same things are in the slides that I showed appear over there, but I then have to put other figures in to make it comfortable. So people see where they fall in. Um, I don't believe that things should be dumbed down to the standpoint of comfort because we're not talking about something that's it wasn't comfortable for us why well, should it be comfortable for anybody else um, my sister recently retired I remember like in the early 90s she was teaching and she showed me this video that was a cartoon about Martin Luther King I'm like that's crazy it shouldn't shouldn't be that way and as a result 
these icons and these images that I'm using in my pieces, they may be something from a kid's book that are now working and playing with other kids and doing things where the other kids are looking at them, but I'm never to the point of trying to dumb it down to make it, you know, feel comfortable or dumb it down. I want people to, to realize there's a point of engagement and they can step in and look at it. And once they figure out what's going on, then it's a matter of them stepping back and realizing where they've been dropped off. Thank you. <clears throat> Hello. Hi. Hey. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the, uh, the uh, Sylvester Stallone Rambo movies, but he said in an interview afterwards, like his goal was to showcase like the atrocities of war and kind of make you turn away, right? So I don't know about for anyone else, but for me, the, the propaganda was the most appalling, like especially seeing that children's book, something that's supposed to be so innocent and it was like really shifted in this light. Um, I think that really accomplished, and for lack of a w better word, like a really holy shit moment. Um, was that How dare you? <laughs> is, is that the, uh, the goal of your, your paintings, was to make people go holy shit? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, well, mission pretty accomplished. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> no, thank you. Hello. Hello. Um, so I just wanted to ask, uh, you had such a wealth of different kind of uh, artifacts and resources to pull from. I was curious if you connected, uh, if specifically you connected more to those that um, had to do with more notable figures like Sidney Poitier and uh, Muhammad Ali and all that, or if you connect more to those artifacts that have more to do with kind of the general populace of the time and, and kind of the rank and file. Uh, I think really what this whole thing is about is kind of the general populace and the rank and file. And I think that that's the hard part of getting it to get a bigger platform because everybody wants to see the stars and the celebrities and all the stuff that they're doing. And I'm like, no, this is these are everyday common people that have lived their lives and done amazing things. And we should be able to look at them for who they were. And that's just what it's capturing. You know, if, the, if I sat here and showed you photographs of the, you know, dignitaries and everything else, you know, we probably wouldn't be having this conversation, but I, and it probably wouldn't be accessible to me. But I feel that, like I said, these are the cave drawings. Instead of seeing a stick figure, bear eaten by man, but man eaten by bear, we actually now, as time goes on, we have these visuals, so let's talk about them. Thank you very much. Thank you. A little short. Hi. Um, Hello. You had mentioned that whenever you see like these artifacts and like stuff like that, you need to like dive deeper into these people. You need to know their story. Do you ever find yourself carrying them and their story with you? And well, that's kind of like a yes, but like, if you do, do you plan on compiling like one like collage or what have you of like all of those really big pieces and people? Yeah, well see, this is part of the, what I'm trying to do. I want to collaborate with people from different platforms. One thing that I would like to do is ultimately collaborate with people in the tech community where you could go and open up something from the collection and you could click on a map and that will take you to all the resources from that area. And it pretty much covers the country. So it creates this, this ability to just go in and find more. I think so often when we talk about collections, it's something that's housed somewhere and never used or never seen again unless it goes on you know, tour. But this needs to be seen and used. We're of the time when we can download this stuff. We can look at it, we can see it. So I'm trying to find like, people to collaborate with, um, whether it's artistically, whether it's technologically, to keep this thing going and to keep it kind of going. There's stories in here that if someone had a play or had a, had a, had a book that they've written, and it's like, look, let's collaborate, let's do this. Here's, I can supply you with this imagery. There's times when um, I, I got contacted by a, a dance company to create artwork behind, and I was trying to sell them, I'm like, look, I can project imagery all across the back of the stage and we can do all these different things. But sometimes it's a matter of the creative part when you're trying to tell somebody the possibilities and they're in another discipline, they can't see it, you know? But I, that's what I wanna do is collaborate with people who have ideas, who wanna push this out and get it in, get it in the hands of like 
an institution or some place that can actually take care of it. The one thing is about being an artist, there's things you can do, but there's always going to be a limit. And it's like when you collect things, anybody in here, whether it's baseball cards or whatever, you know, your allowance is only going to allow you to buy a certain number of baseball cards. You guys buy Yu Yu Gi Oh cards. You guys are much younger. <laughs> Beyblades or whatever. <laughs> So yeah, you you know, I can't I can't do this on my own, you know? So it's like you have to figure out how, but it's it's a necessary thing because it's for the protection and you know, of history and culture. Thanks. You're welcome. Thank you. These questions are great, aren't they, Billy? They are. Hello. Hello. Um, I'm really interested in personal history and going back and keeping those memories alive and you incorporated a little bit of your Grandfather, so I was wondering how much of it do you get from your family? Do they are they huge collectors of their own personal history and that sort of inspired you, or did you have to go and dig? Because I did. <laughs> I, I to be honest with you, my family probably wonders what I'm doing here right now. <laughs> and I don't say that to, that like you know, it's like you keep. This is kind of like your closeted habit. Oh, he's going to the flea market again. Oh, he's. But this is kind of what I do and. From my grandfather, my stamp, my with him, we ha we had like a great bond. You know, it was like you know, I here it is. You know, I'm going somewhere. It's like nine o'clock in the morning, and I'm getting a call, and I'm like, "What are you doing? Just got a cell phone." You know, <laughs> like what? So that was like how our connection was. But most of the the only things in there that are from him are just those photographs. But everything else is totally separate, and it's something that. I always felt that I needed to do what I wanted to do, and I just I just like collecting. But nobody else in my family, I wish I did have a team of people that could go out and hunt flea markets and do different dumpster dive. <laughs> but yeah, nobody else really, they don't have that bug. They think I'm here for an art show, which I am, but they're like, what are you talking about? I'm like, oh, well. So a lot of people don't have interest in history anymore. You know, unless it's looking back at what happened on Facebook in 2012. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. You know, um, Billy, I have so many questions about your work that I that I would like to bring up, but I think you know, I, I think it's more apropos because I think the the biggest question for me was, and I hope I don't butcher it, but when you showed the the, the kind of cut up picture of the Tuskegee Airmen. And you made the comment um, about how they how something burned. They would say, "Oh, that that really burns me." I yeah. guess. What really burns you? Ooh. Um. What burns me Besides is size questions like that. No, no, no. Yeah, no. Right. Well, I guess what burns me, and it probably burns everybody in here. It's like walking into a room of equals and not being seen as an equal. That really burns me you know, or having to like play a silent game of understanding to be in the game when it's like, it's kind of unnecessary. And um, the fact that I am using this history to tell a story also shows you how long it's been going on, you know, and it's just kind of obvious. And the fact that I'm trying to keep something alive that everyone's still trying to suppress is, is, is hard for me. And the fact that, you know, and there's, there's a whole bunch more of this stuff, you know, there's films, there's, you know, all kinds of crazy stuff, but it's stuff that needs to be seen. And the fact that, you know, it, it's, it's almost like, yeah, not, not that, I mean, I'm not saying in this audience, I'm just saying in many audiences, it's just kind of like, yeah, go ahead. Hello again. Hello. Hi. Um, so it's the oh shit guy. Welcome yeah, back. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's uh, the follow up question. Right? <laughs> um, so another question about your paintings is: so um, I think art is inherently beautiful, right? Mm -hmm. However, your paintings are are depicting a really dark part of history. So do you find that difficult to showcase something so dark and so disgusting in a beautiful way? It's hard. It's like it's like the delicate balance that you do. It's really hard. It's not easy. I mean, there's times when I am like, oh God, that's, I get it, you know? And there's times that, uh, 
people will come over or come to your studio and they'll come in and like, oh God, nobody wants to see that. And they'll sit and look at it and they'll be like, I really get this now. So there's that moment where it just kind of comes off like that one painting, uh, the horde, the landscape painting. I think everybody thought I was crazy when I first started making that. And I'm like, well, why am I crazy when I'm talking about something that's actually taking place? And I'm using different imagery that you can connect, different iconography to connect to to understand what's going on. But they they're like instantly like, oh, I can't look at that. I'm like, well, that's what's going on. And over a period of time, they settle into it, and they're like, I understand it. They take time, you know. And I guess maybe in some cases with me, painting is a message versus it being an exercise of trying to. Uh, say just display something like I want you to I want you to get something from it mm -hmm. and I think in many cases the things that people may get from it may be something that they didn't come for thank you and on a, a little bit of a tangent but it's not completely unrelated I do uh, I agree with you that you know I think um, embedding some of this actual like imagery of things that exist in the history it's it's really important because um, I don't know if I'm speaking for anyone else, but growing up and and hearing in classes things that happen, they're just words. It's kind of like you you hear a number and it's just a statistic, or you hear things that happen and it's just things you memorize for a class and a test. But you know when you see images like that, I think it really hits home. So uh, you're doing great work. Oh, thank you. I, I mean, that's the other thing. I've tried to uh, get with uh, people to create open source school books so that you can see it. But you know how hard that is. It's like these things, these are ideas that shouldn't be that difficult, but it's like finding the right people for the right things. Uh-oh, come on, man. No, dude, I have a, I have a friend, he's like, uh, I think he just recently turned 40, okay. and he's a teacher. Man, and, he's old. Yeah, man. <laughs> um, but he got in trouble, his wife is a teacher as well, and she got in trouble because they, they showed um, unfiltered, like unadulterated excerpts from Anne Frank's diary, right? right? And they're like, oh, this is too explicit, like these kids. And, um, you know, I just thought that was just like a lack of respect for the kids that just because they're young, they can't handle these things because I just think, uh, you know, if you, you don't understand history and you don't acknowledge history, then you're doomed to repeat it. Yeah, so. I agree 100%. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's what this is about. You know what I mean? It's like understanding it. It's, uh, it's being able to see it and be like, oh, that's terrible. I mean, we have memories and minds that allow us to connect with photographs and images, and they've been doing it for years, and they've used it against people. So like now, when you're trying to use it for good, people don't always want to do it, mm -hmm. and I don't understand it. Yeah, it's almost like the words don't even do the, uh, the events justice. Like, you need the imagery, you know, yeah. just hand in hand. Yeah, you totally need the imagery. And I mean, you know, <laughs> I did an exhibition with the one piece where the policeman is grabbing the lady by the neck and um, it was at a gallery and this little boy comes in and he's like, oh man, daddy, that that man's mean. What did that lady do? And it's like, that's where the conversation starts. Yeah. She didn't do anything. She's just kind of being herself and he doesn't like who she is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you have any like particular experience that made you gravitate towards this concentration of work? Oh yeah, I mean, I could. Um, if we have another several hours, I'm sure we could. <laughs> I mean, I think yeah, definitely. I mean, it's it's just it's just necessary. Absolutely. And I think also it's like so often it's um, you know nothing traumatic like that, but I mean it's like still it's just like it's an unnecessary thing and mm -hmm. just trying to get people to bring light to it. It's just like perpetual, consistent, just like it's it's in the background, but it's there. And it was like a, I guess it wasn't really a straw that broke the camel's back. That it was like, oh, I got to shed some light on this. Well, I'll tell you one that's really funny. Mm -hmm. And I've said this story before. And um, my grandfather, my grandfather was a brilliant man. You know, he was just a brilliant man. I mean, he was a pilot. He gets out of the military and he wants to get a job as a commercial pilot. Impossible. Couldn't do that. You know, so it's like he would go to interview places and they'd be like, here's a broom, here's a mop. You know, and that was the thing that was just crazy, right? Mm -hmm. So fast forward to me, I am probably uh, 12 years old. 
12, 13 years old. And he made this contract where I, I moved in with my grandparents for the summer. Um, I was helping my grandfather build this wall in the backyard. And um, my grandparents lived across the street from a playground. So every morning I'd get up, clock in my time, we'd go in the back and you know, he, he everybody, I grew up on an all black street. Everybody on that street knew how to do something, but they were pretty much limited by their color and who was gonna hire them. But you're talking about a genius group of people, all right? You had a mechanic, you had, you had everything. You know, but they were limited by, by color. And um, I was helping him each day. Everybody would get off work and come and help. Everybody helped each other build their houses in that, in that community. And that's the way it was. And I remember I heard the basketball bouncing across the street. And I'm like, uh, Pap Pap, can I go play basketball? And he's like, you need to stay here so you know how to do this stuff when you get older. I was like, I'm going to get an office job when I get older, so I'm not going to need to know how to do that. He talks, he turns around, and it's just the whole slew. Everybody was retired at that point. And he's like, hey, fellas. He used to call me Hot Shot, jokingly. He's like, Hot Shot thinks he's going to get a job in an office. <laughs> they laughed me out. They just all started laughing like, oh, yeah, go ahead. He thinks he's going to get a job in the office. He thinks he's going to get a job doing something. I go over there, I, I think I took one or two shots and guilt brought me back. Do you get what I'm saying? Uh -huh. I think so. Yeah, so it's just like, yeah. you realize that, you know, those opportunities weren't available for them. And, you know, it's like, they're telling you things that you need to listen to. I and think we've, we've, that gap has been lost where we listen to elders. Yeah, it's, it's also mind boggling that like you see these images and you, you hear these stories and it's like, oh, that's history. But man, that's a handful of decades ago. It's not that far away, you know? Not at all. You know, not until some of those people are still alive. Some of them have recently passed on, but we're talking history, but it's a time that, you know, we're still affected by. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, uh, you're doing great work once again. Uh, it was um, a pleasure. Thank you. I want to thank everybody for their questions, but I think we are at around the 4, 405 mark. So I'd like to uh, invite, uh, if, if you want to come up and ask Billy an individual question, you'd be welcome to do that. Please go to Rosenberg Gallery in Calkins Hall. And uh, I think one last uh, hand for uh, Billy Colbert. Thank you. Thank you, Billy. Thank you.